Thanks very much, Georgia, and yeah, thanks everyone for coming. Um, tonight we're going to keep things pretty conversational because we don't sort of have someone asking us questions. So um, I guess it might be good just to start with where it all started. Nick, do you want to speak a little bit about how this project began? Um, let's introduce ourselves first. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Okay. Um, okay, I'll start. <laughs> I'm Nikki Cumpston and I'm Zena's sister. I'm the older sister, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, and um, our family are Barkindji people from the Barka, our Darling River, and we also have Afghan, Irish and English heritage. And our family was um, originally from Wilcannia and, and Broken Hill and um, Karachi. <laughs> so we, um, we have been working on this project together collectively, but I also work at the Art Gallery of South Australia as a curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. And I also am the artistic director of Tarnandi, which is a, a festival of contemporary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art. And it's been my absolute pleasure to work on this project with, with this incredible group of artists. And uh, we do have one of our artists who's not here. He had to return back to Broken Hill for work, David Doyle. So yeah, it's a collective of six of us Barkindji artists. Thanks, Nikki, and hi everyone. My name's Ken Morris. I'm a Barkindji man on my father's side. So Dad's parents were all also born in the Barker, and our family has strong connections to north of that river. So as the Barker starts down in Wentworth and winds its way up to Burke, our ancestry is around the Burke area. And so we are, we are Gunu Barkindji people, northern Barkindji, with strong ties to Burke and Turali Station in that area. And one of the other connections we have among many of us is a strong connection to Tipperborough, where my father was born, which is 300 k's north of Broken Hill. And that's been an interesting connecting point for us and our families, given the movements of, of Barkindji people and many other people around that area, and particularly into Tipperborough in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And on my mother's side, our ancestry goes back to Northern Ireland. So that's my combination of, of cultures and histories. And it's been a fantastic project to be a part of and to learn more about those connecting histories and how, how our families all interconnect with that beautiful river. Oh, also, sorry, I have another hat too. <laughs> so you, I also um, lead an organisation called The Torch, which supports First Nations men and women whose lives have been impacted by the criminal justice system or either in prison or recently released from prison with an art and cultural program that works to not only empower stories but economic uh, engagement with the arts industry and building pathways away from, from prison. So that's part of the community con connectivity that I have through my art and cultural practice. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Raymond Zader. I'm based in Adelaide. When I'm not uh, creating art, I'm working for myself as a database developer. I share the same uh, Barkindji Afghan heritage with Nikki and Zina, our grandfathers are brothers. Uh, and with Adrienne, our, so the three of us, our great grandmother is the sister of Adrienne's great grandmother. So that's our, our connection together as the four cousins in this project. Uh, and on my mum's side, I uh, have connections to Sydney and then back to Scotland. Hello everyone, my name is Adrienne Simmons. Um, I'm a Barkindji artist. My, um, that comes from my mother's side, um, from the Dennis and from the Payne families. Um, my parents are from Broken Hill, but I grew up on Ghana country, um, and that's where I currently live as well. Um, I'm a dance practitioner, so my work is um, shared through dance performance, um, choreography, uh, more recently, screen dance and um, a passion for working with young people. I'm also the learning manager of Australian Dance Theatre, so uh, working on the company's community outreach programs. Thanks, Adrian. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Zena Cumpston, and as Nikki said, we're sisters. Um, both of us made the insane decision to include artworks and curate the show. Um, so we co curated and we both put um, works into the show as well. I live here in um, um, Melbourne and uh, I mainly work as a storyteller. I sort of use that term because it encompasses everything I do, but I do writing, um, sometimes curating, um, actually lots of different things, but if I say storyteller, it fits quite well. 
So Nick, should we talk a little bit about like where it began in terms of, um, I guess it really started with you, this project? It, this has been such a great opportunity. It started with a conversation between myself and Georgia Cribb and Penny Teal here at Bunjil Place Gallery. And it was an opportunity for me to be able to exhibit my works of art. And I came out to have a look at the gallery with Penny and Georgia. Gee, that was back in about 2020? Something? Just before COVID, wasn't it? It was, anyway. Um, I came out and had a look at this incredible gallery space. And because I have a full-time job and I'm really busy in, in my day job, I just felt overwhelmed and thought there was no way that I would be able to do this opportunity justice on my own. And for years I'd been thinking about the idea of working with other fellow Barkindji artists and speaking to Zena about that opportunity. And so together we developed an idea and presented that idea to Georgia and Penny. And they've been so wonderful and supportive of our proposition and together we've applied for, for funding and we've had little bits of seed funding and then further funding now to tour this exhibition. So the whole notion of creating this body of work came from us thinking about being able to engage our country in the conversation. It wasn't about us thinking about what work we were going to put in the exhibition because we didn't know. It wasn't anything that was planned as in this work fits this. It was about us being able to engage and to be together back out on country in order to learn from each other because collectively we all have our own body of knowledge but in order to be able to learn more about who we are and where we come from and what our land really means and how it expresses itself, was, was, that was the important thing for us. And so we were supported to take trips back out onto Barkindji country. And there were three journeys that we all did together. And then separately, we each all did an additional journey. So it really has been a collective experience. But I'll let you guys talk a bit more about what you, your own perspective on what we did. Yeah, does anyone want to share, I guess, um, how these journeys out on country um, resonated with you in terms of thinking about what works you were going to make and how the, I guess, the impetus from Nikki and I and all of us together to have country as an active participant in the exhibition, I guess, how that's played out for you? For me, I guess, knowing that we were going on country to, to be inspired um, or to have the works that we create in, be inspired by that, my initial thing was kind of everything we did was like, is this inspiring? Is, is, <laughs> am I going to respond to this and this? But, yeah. And it just got to the point where there was, there was so much happening for us on country that you just had to let that go and be there and experience what was happening. And one of the, I guess, best moments for me was that first day at Kinjiga where we were in there and then um, David Doyle went out to the storage area and brought out the, the grinding stones for us and just to be able to see them and touch them was just amazing and, and it just took that kind of mindset away of and totally immersed you into the experience of okay we're here now we're on country and kind of the journey is beginning. At Kinchiga National Park there are a lot of sites where they've been archaeologically assessed and there are when you walk there are areas that you can walk in where there are still incredible amounts of grinding stones and different elements that are left there from our ancestors and the work that they've done in order to process foods to be able to survive on country. And to be able to walk from where you're staying, we were just staying at the Shearer's quarters there, and to take a walk that was 10 minutes in one direction and to be able to see that evidence in the ground was completely awe-inspiring for us. And one of the things that has happened there is that people have been documenting what's been found, and so they're kept in a holding, they're in a, a, 
a, a place, a keeping place for the time being until something more permanent can be set up. But we, we were able to access some of those objects and look at them and hold them and feel them. And that was, that was you know, one of, one of those moments for us where we all just couldn't quite believe what we were experiencing. I think that was, <clears throat> excuse me, that was the first, um, well, that, that day where we travelled from Broken Hill to Menindi and then being, being at Kinchiga was um, the first experience as well of David Doyle's generosity in, in, in this entire project. When you have a look at some of the photos that are in the welcome space, you'll see David Doyle there and then you'll see three or four of us following him. <laughs> And that's kind of how it went for, for all of our trips on country. There'd be occasions where David would say, I'm going over there to pee, don't follow me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and another one of those really special moments was we were putting, we were putting the grinding stones back into, into the storage space. And I said to David, uh, you know, do you mind if I take some photos of these? And he said, you know, go for it. They're as much yours as they are mine. And that, you know, that really summed up David's generosity as well is, you know, just that real inclusiveness and making us feel welcome on country. It also makes me think about um, the opportunity for us to be together and to be sharing of how it inspired and supported each of our practices. And I know when I'm thinking about our time together and even thinking about um, being in the space when, Nikki, when you were laying out all of your, um, I don't know what's the right word, of, of your prints and thinking about how, how you were going to select the work so that we're then going to, to now be exhibited on, on the wall and these discussions that we had together, but the energy that we felt together was really precious. And there were times where we were sitting around the table and, and sharing information or, or talking about what we'd done that day or talking about our interests for the, or for our work, but there were also times when we were just sitting on country and we were quiet and we were just completely present in those spaces. And I think of some of the photos of sh that are shared when we're, we're taking, well, and for me particularly taking my shoes off and sitting in those spaces with my, my, my feet in the dirt or my feet in the sand and just listening to all of those sounds and drawing upon those memories and, and the feeling and the presence of being in those places with each other and how strong that has been and how that's carried through in all of our works. Yeah, that's very true. One thing I think about is how we, all the times that I go back to country, it's always to see family. It's always for family reunions, it's always to make sure as much as I can see all the rallies, which is very difficult because it's a huge expanse of space and there's so many rallies and you're running around madly trying to catch up with everybody and also learning from uh, family members around our culture and specifically related to our family though, generally speaking. And so this was the first time I've, I've ever been on country with a group of us Bark and Giardas together um, and outside of that all that family stuff that always happens, which is just so beautiful, and I'm always then making works singularly. <laughs> and this idea for this uh, travelling and journey of learning together was something really quite unique and something that I hadn't experienced before, and I'm not sure any of us have in terms of this group together and how focused it was and how in, we were together for that period of time, not only learning and experiencing country together on many levels but kind of living together and doing all, all those day-to-day -day things together and so the I guess the idea of the exhibition and into this wonderful title of, of Nadacha is far more it's on a far deeper level than it might seem this word together it's it's all of us together not only all of us but in, I think as in Raymond's beautiful work all of us extending out through a First Nations lens to all our families and ancestors and, and to everybody connecting to our country and culture and learning about that and us learning at the same time. It's that more broader period, more broader understanding of what together or us means. Yeah. Yeah, and for me, um, I guess it was um, really empowering because I had not made artworks before and I felt really supported by the fact that I was doing it as part of a collective. I think perhaps if um, for some reason I'd ended up being asked to be part of an exhibition and I didn't have um, 
my mob kind of with me and part of this extended opportunity to really have a lot of time to think um, and to be taken by country and to be immersed, um, I'm not sure I would have been able to produce works because it's certainly not easy as all of you know more than me because you've done it all before. Um, but yeah, I felt very, very supported in being able to make something um, from scratch that was absolutely new. And I think that's that for me is one of the key, the, one of the really important things about this opportunity was that, that we could just be ourselves, but that, that, that we could collectively think about, it was like a creative development that was ongoing, which as a visual artist, I've only ever worked in my own head. I mean, there have been times where Z's come out with me, um, my partner John has come out with me when I've been photographing, but this was a chance for all of us to be part of that creative development, which I think, I think is a, a really unique thing for the visual arts, but it's something that within film and within theatre, it's just part of the process. And so I think for me it's unlocked something that I really think is going to be an important part of my practice going forward, because I think that collectively you always come up with better ideas than just one single mind thinking about something. So that's what's been really important for me, a really important learning. Um, I guess it might be nice for the people who've come to hear a little bit about um, each of the individual artworks and kind of what's behind them, but I might just start with the welcome space, which is here behind us. Uh, we worked with two really wonderful designers. So we had Jackson Plumley, who was um, the designer for the show overall, and then Madeline Critchley, who uh, did all the 2D design. But Jack's really listened to us very carefully and we talked him through the process and what we had done and he was really taken with some of the photos that we shared with him that showed lots of different settings that we stayed in and quite often we used Broken Hill as a base and kind of went out from there. So we stayed in lots of holiday house kind of situations and Jack just saw all of these different kind of lounge rooms where we're all standing around talking sometimes, um, making lots um, very often um, together. So we, we made lots of items that ended up being in the show together. Um, so yeah, he wanted to, I guess, reflect that. And so when he drew up the designs, he showed us this beautiful room that he had made. Because we also said to him, we really want people to not come into a normal gallery setting where they might feel um, uncomfortable or it's that kind of sterile white cube because that's not what this show is about. We as Aboriginal people have storytelling at the heart of everything that we do and that's about bringing people in in a really warm and generous and welcoming space. So the room behind us actually has um, lounges and it's kind of a representation of um, a holiday house and the places that we were together gathering in. And we also each made photograph books that were really about our families. So as Aboriginal people, it's important that we can position ourselves um, when we're introducing ourselves to other Aboriginal people as part of our protocols. But also we wanted to introduce ourselves to the people coming to the show because this show is as much about the end products as it is the process, and the process is us, Naracha, together. So that room um, has been really popular so far and on opening it was lovely to see so many people sitting in there. Sometimes some of them stayed for a long time, I'm told. Um, and there's so much to see in those tins. We've got newspaper cuttings about graduations and all sorts of things about our grandparents. But also, yeah, these lovely books that talk you through who we are, but also um, all move into the trips that we had together because I think we ended up with thousands of photos because we're kind of all keen um, photographers. Some of us are professional. Um, so yeah, there's a, a wealth of information in there that I think is a lovely storytelling journey in itself. And Raymond made a beautiful soundscape um, that you might be able to hear now. Um, and that also, I think, helps people to relax. I know myself, when I uh, hear the sounds of country, I feel myself relaxing. And we really wanted people to, to feel really comfortable because ultimately, we want you to come into our country and we want you to experience our country through our works. And you need to be relaxed to do that. Did you want to talk about your work, Nick, and maybe we can go down the line and just speak a little bit more specifically about what we actually ended up making and sharing? Okay. <laughs> um, I've been a photographer since oh, the late 80s was when I went to art school. 
and I've been working mainly with black and white photography. So I still work with black and white film. And so my works are over on that side of the gallery. Um, you can see the panoramic images. And they're created with a panoramic camera. So it's dedicated to that format. And I use 35 millimeter film. So that's you know that kind of height. And the negative them the itself is two and a quarter times the width of a normal 35 millimeter negative. So that format is the way that the image has been created in the camera. Um, the film is developed and then I have the film scanned and printed onto watercolor paper. And then what I've done is I've hand colored them with, they're called pan pastels and they're like a little makeup pan of color and they come in I think I've got 88 different colours. They're really beautiful, soft, really finely ground pigment, and they're applied with a makeup sponge onto the photograph. So really fine work because the colour actually goes a long way. So in order to get the tones and the colour that I want, I actually am mixing a lot of colour together for each of the individual rocks. So the site itself is a beautiful location on our country. It's at Murawindji National Park, which is about 130 kilometres northeast of Broken Hill. So you head towards Tipperborough and then you turn off to the right. And this country is absolutely phenomenal. There, are, there is permanent water here. It's a really important site for Barkindji people and also quite a few different neighbouring um, groups of Aboriginal people and also people from even further afield would come to this location for ceremony, for trade, for exchange of knowledge. It's a really, you can feel the energy and you can see the different groups of people that have come through, through the rock art that is evident in many different parts of the country. So in the Undercrofts, which is really soft sort of sandstone country, you can see the ochre um, imagery where the ochre has been mixed in the mouth and then sprayed out onto the hands. So you see these beautiful hand stencils through there. And then there's also peckings. So there's a number of different types of rock art evident throughout different parts of, of this country. It's quite an expansive country. We were staying at, um, a, at, a, at a location which is where traditional owners come and there are rangers that live there. And we actually had Uncle Leroy Johnson and the Waterbag Band, which was a band that was formed around the campfire at Murawindji. They came and launched the exhibition for us on Sunday. Um, that was an absolute treat for us. Um, but it is a place where it's a central place where people are coming constantly while we were there. There were many different groups of people coming through. On one day, on one occasion, we ended up planting trees with the local land care people. And um, there were other people that came and stayed in the same camp that we were in that were traditional owners that were going up in helicopters and doing a count of the yellow-footed rock wallabies that are endangered there. So they were counting um, the, the rock wallabies that they could see. And then there were also people that were herding goats. There are a lot of wild goats there. So really busy, it was like Grand Central Station. <laughs> and um, also there's a camping ground, so there are people that come and visit and, and spend time walking on the many different walks through our country. But this particular gorge is Old Murawindji Gorge. And this day was a beautiful day. It was gorgeous weather. We left quite early in the morning to go there and we walked up through the gorge and were able to witness just the, the absolute beauty of this gorge, the colour of the rocks, all of the different plants that are growing. And these guys are much more nimble than I am and so they clambered up to the top and in the undercrofts and actually in one of those images, um, I didn't realise until I enlarged the image that I'd captured some of these guys up in one of the undercrofts. So you can just see them sitting there looking out. But one of the things that, that I felt that day was Mirambili, which is happy and contented. 
and I could hear their voices ringing through because of the echo of that beautiful atmosphere through that gorge. I could hear them really quite clearly and they were all laughing and talking and so that kind of resonated for me and it really emulates the way I felt about this opportunity of being able to work together and to create this body of work was Mirambili, happy and contented. <laughs> Kent, did you want to speak a little bit about your work? We'll just go down the line. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, you're all facing away from it, but it's all the stuff behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's all the stuff behind you there. <laughs> and this is also uh, a, a series of works developed from photos taken on, on the same day that Nikki's just described at, at Mudawinchi Gorge. And it's later in the day, but you can see in the backgrounds of some of the works here, that was the kind of day it was, that beautiful blue sky. That were, these, these were taken around four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was a, an absolutely magical day, beautiful day on country. And towards the, towards the end of the day, I heard a sound in the, in the sky that I hadn't heard on all of our trips um, until this point, and it was the arrival of two katakataka or pink cockatoos. And so, up on the on the higher grounds of the of the cliffs, I scrambled down, very excited because I hadn't heard their call uh, until this point. And on, upon coming down, could see that they were tending a nest in the in the hollow of a large river red gum where there would have been a number of eggs in there and the male and female taking turns to, to watch over the nest and then to get, get food from other places. And I think what I was trying to relay in, in these photographic works and then the, the extrapolation into that moving image work behind you is again that long history that's in that place and the generations of knowledge and activity and that ongoing sense of continuity for us and that we were there in this place after tens of thousands of years of generations of people being in that place, the change that's occurred in that place but some of the constants that are there. And to try and make comment in these works on some of the changes that are impacting negatively on our country, some of which have already been raised around the herding of the, of the feral animals and particularly the goats and for these beautiful Kartikartika, how they're now on the threatened species list in this country. And part of the reason for that is the clearing of the trees, these really old, old gums to form those hollows in the trees that are the only places that these beautiful birds will nest. It takes a long time. And yet a lot of these trees have been cleared off country and for them to regenerate is very problematic because often they are just devoured and destroyed by the, the invasive animals on our country. Also, these beautiful birds are, are ground. They, they feed up in the trees, but they feed on the ground with seeds and grasses. And again, the, in, the invasive nature of so many of the feral animals destroys that food source for them. So this was a moment in time, a very quiet moment, um, when they came in. And just thinking a lot around that, and how they are connected to our culture in a very deep way around some of our creation stories, particularly the one of the two Nutchi travelling. And those ideas of locating areas on our country through these beautiful stories and how important these follows are, yet we're seeing them decline in massive numbers and for us that's a very complex and problematic aspect of a simple moment of two birds tending a nest, which I wanted to try and convey as part of also the ongoing nature of their importance and our our knowledges and philosophies and how important they are to be heard and listened to. So um, uh, my work is over here, it's the, the red and white work. It's 2046 hand-drawn individuals uh, and that's representing my parents and then their parents and their parents and their parents for 10 generations. Uh, and it's a response to uh, a few of the things that happened across the journey. So there's the, there's the waving pattern representing, um, so the work is called Bloodlines. Uh, so there's a waving pattern uh, representing the, the water that we saw on country, being able to visit and see the barker for the first time and seeing it full was just the most amazing experience. Uh, and one of the other things that we did while we were on country on that first trip 
was Adrienne had an A4 piece of paper with, there were maybe 15 or 20 names on it. And um, we all decided that we would flesh that out and, and add in the information that we knew. And from previous experience, I knew that turns into a, a pretty big thing uh, very quickly. So I downloaded some genealogy software and the four of us added in the information that we knew. And then when we were at Kinchiga, two of our other cousins came and joined us and they filled in the gaps as well. So um, over that weekend, the six of us listed 364 relatives that we knew of. So uh, in my photo book in the welcome space, you'll get to see that, that family tree uh, fanning out in there, uh, as well as a photo of the six of us and, and where we fit within that tree. Uh, and so th the work kind of responds to, because a common response from, from people when they see the family tree is, oh, you're so lucky to be part of such a large family, I wish I had that. And this work uh, is reminding us that actually all of us have that, because it's not only my parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, but it's also your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents, because there are no cousins, there are no uncles, aunties in that. It's all direct bloodline relatives. So every single one of us, no matter how many people are in our family, or if we're adopted, or if we're part of the stolen generation, we all have that and we all belong to that. So we're all connected to um, this many people, as well as connected to the places that were special to those people as well. So it's just a reminder that we do all have much broader connections than, than our immediate family or just back to, to our grandparents. Um, and my work in the little cove space in, in the corner there um, is a screen dance film called Guntri, which is a Barkindji word for shadow um, and reflection. And this was an opportunity to continue to explore an interest in creating um, movement that is telling stories of place. And for this, it was my, my story and my connection to country, um, to kin, to kin that we share in this project, to kin, my family, thinking of the starting point being my grandparents' house in Broken Hill and, and this place that I have been travelling to, this journey from Ghana country in Adelaide to Willakala country on Broken Hill and kin all of our kin and wider kin, our ancestors, these incredible moments of um, holding these grindstones and imagining our ancestors using, using these um, possessions. And the, I, yeah, I can't really even explain how I felt seeing and holding that the first day, as everyone has said, it was incredibly emotional. And then the movement became this archive or this recollection of these experiences. Um, and mapping journeys. So I've been interested in, in playing with string in movement and building upon um, a work called Immerse that I created with the dancers at Australian Dance Theatre in um, 2001 and first brought some string into the space as a way of mapping journeys and mapping place. And this idea of mapping our journey as well as mapping my travels visiting family was explored um, on film. So filmed at several locations, including my grandparents' back lane, really interested in using um, that iron fence and drawing upon memories of myself in those spaces, dancing in the dirt, watching my shadow um, as the sun set, to our journeys to Kinshika, and that's why I chose that site. That was um, our first trip together in that how incredible it felt to be surrounded by this group of amazing people and how inspired I was and, and these in, incredible times. So the, the, the film is almost a marker or a map of our place and our experiences. Um, I was also thinking about the use of shadow and, and reflection drawing upon some of those memories, but thinking about shadow and reflection as, as those that have come before us um, of our family history. And I was also thinking about um, the, the ability for me to, to share my story, but perhaps some of my family before me as, as sitting in the shadows. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so I made three pieces in the end, and each one of those pieces speaks to each other. And I guess they really are um, from a foundation of the research that I've been doing for quite a few years around Aboriginal plant use. So looking at plant use right across the southeast of Australia, 
Um, I've done a couple of projects that have focused here on plant use in Nam and across the Kulin Nations. Uh, but luckily for me, a lot of the plants that are present in this part of the country are also present on my country, which was really lovely. The more I got to research and understand, I saw so many connections, especially in um, knowledge and the way that we've used these plants over a really long period of time. All of my work in all of the storytelling work that I do is really about empowering Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's um, knowledge of country in the hope that I guess one day we'll be much more empowered to go back to being able to fulfil our custodial responsibility. So I think our knowledge of country for me is very much misunderstood. Um, I was working for a, a group called the Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub at the University of Melbourne for a few years as a research fellow. And my, my job predominantly there was to research um, plant use, but to put it in an urban context. And I think one thing that I really um, got from that work and all of the work that I presented as part of the projects that I chose to do was that people don't really see urban areas as country. And I think we have a bit of a skewed view about what country is as well. So all of the work I do really is trying to bring people in to our ways of knowing. So I did um, the lino cut works really um, speak to the plant knowledge that I have been really lucky to be able to delve into. And if I went through each one of the, the um, I guess, yeah, the assemblages that I've put together, I could talk to you probably for an hour and a half um, because each one of them is, I guess, quite symbolic and there are many, many layers of stories that come out from each of those tiles and why I chose to kind of use them um, and the boomerangs as well. The weaving that I did is really um, also in the same vein in that I've chosen to, to weave um, kakala, which is our bush banana. And I also have painted them in kopai, which is a, um, a pigment, a gypsum, that's found on our country that we've processed for the longest time imaginable. And we've used it across a huge realm of cultural activities. So it's used in mourning practice, and it's also used right through the other end, celebration, dance, and also in the painting of cultural items and decorations. So I process that in the same way that our ancestors have for a very long time, um, Uncle Badger and Uncle Badger Bates, who helped us a lot on this project through various um, opportunities we had to come together with um, himself and also Aunty Sarah Martin, his wife, uh, told me how to do it. And I also uh, got advice from David Doyle. And I wanted to paint these bush bananas in Kopai because I thought it was a really powerful way to talk about how I feel about our traditional food ways and what's happened since invasion. And I feel very much in mourning the more that I find out how nutritionally valuable and how absolutely innovative our people have been on country to be able to use plants for every single thing that we need and to interact in a sustainable way. Um, it makes me so sad that this isn't part of our lives today. And I also wanted to celebrate that knowledge because it is very much still alive within our communities. Nothing is lost. There's just not enough resourcing is how I see it. Every time there's resourcing to shine a light on different knowledge and communities, it brings up so much when we are resourced to do different projects. And they're often arts projects as well that bring out lots of really valuable scientific knowledge of country because ultimately our knowledge of plants is extremely scientific and a lot of people don't really want to admit that or see it as science. But to carefully observe plants, to understand how to process something, often through many, many distinct processes, to turn it from extremely poisonous to something that's extremely nutritionally and medicinally valuable or valuable as um, a technology, it takes a lot of um, very, very careful watching, experimenting, replicating, and then passing that knowledge on. And that's the basis of science. Uh, so yeah, it's been really important to me to, to share these stories because I think plants really open up a portal for people to have greater respect and understanding of the complexity of our knowledge of country. And that's something I've really enjoyed delving into because it's also an area that reaches a huge audience in terms of who's interested. So I've worked lots with kids and right through to university professors and everyone in between. And people seem to find plants, um, yeah, a nice portal to, to help them to understand our interactions with country um, in a more specific way. 
And the work you see behind us is also part of um, these other works in that I was very um, fortunate to co-write a book as part of the First Knowledges series which came out last year called Plants, Past, Present, Future. And in that book, I wrote a whole chapter that's based on this beautiful photograph taken in 1879 on our country at a place called Momba Station by a man called Frederick Bonney, who actually, unlike many of the people of his time, had an extremely respectful and caring relationship with our mob. So even after he went home um, to Staffordshire in England, he kept in contact with lots of our mob um, and they seemed to really like him from the, the letters and things that went between. And so what Frederick Bonney captured in this um, photograph is much more than Doughboy, Jacob and um, Mary, Doughboy's their daughter, but actually there's more than 20 plants that David Doyle, Uncle Badger, Aunty Sarah and I were able to identify together. And then I wrote a whole too long chapter about all of it that was about 8,000 words that I could have made 20. Um, but I guess I really wanted to include this work as well because it's my favourite image probably of all time. I feel really... Um, I feel really emotional each time I look at it and I first saw it when I was at university about 10 or 12, 12 years ago and uh, a non-Aboriginal historian who I was working for was writing about this image and I was really itching to be given an opportunity to give my perspective um, and so this was my opportunity to write from my perspective and yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. But um, I wanted to make it accessible, all that research that I'd done to a wide audience again. So what I've done is I've created a room sheet and on that room sheet it takes you into different parts of this photograph and there's usually a bench here and people can sit down and they can go through the photograph and look at what I'm talking about, the grinding stone, there's a water bag in here that's made from um, a wallaby or a kangaroo and it's still in the shape. So that's what our people did to store grain and also water to travel long distances and keep things for a long time. Uh, there's so many different plants that have been used for technologies particularly. And so in my lino cut prints, I've taken out, I guess, um, symbols and stories that speak about our deep knowledge of country and our innovation over time. And I've unpacked them a bit in this. So I'm hoping that people can make the connection between the three works. And the text that I use in the work really speaks to, I guess, something that I'm quite fired up about in that I see that Indigenous knowledge is still being plundered all the time and that's what's been happening since invasion. And definitely with our plants, that's still a really, really big problem Biopiracy is a huge problem in Australia and we don't have any overarching laws that protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's intellectual, cultural and property rights. Um, and so it's something that I've been really concerned about. And I put this text in, one of them is Our Traditional Foods, it's a white thing. And I'm drawing a parallel between uh, the Aboriginal art industry and the bush foods industry. So. At the moment in Australia, the bush foods industry is worth around $80 million per year. And by 2025, um, it's been tracked to be worth double that, so $160 million per year. And unfortunately, less than 2% of the profits and benefits from this burgeoning industry are actually going back to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And so I, I saw, when I first started researching this area a few years ago, because I've been so enmeshed and interested in the arts, a real parallel between the disparity in who benefits from the Aboriginal art industry also. And um, Richard Bell, who's an Aboriginal artist, uh, actually wrote a manifesto. And in that he says, Aboriginal art, it's a white thing. And he unpacks disparities in benefit in that manifesto, which he wrote many years ago. And so that's why I, I use this text, because I'm trying to draw those parallels between who benefits when it looks, it's something that looks like it's really, really celebrating and empowering our people and our culture, but actually there's a massive disparity in who is um, receiving the benefit. And I think it's something we all have to think about uh, in terms of making this place that we now call Australia a much more equitable and viable place for us to be much healthier. And I guess one of the things that really drives me a bit nuts is the fact that um, to taste my foods, I would have to go to a restaurant and have a, you know, $200 plus degustation menu. That makes me quite cross. Um, so 
I, in lots of the work I've done, I've tried to advocate for a return, a return to our knowledge and a return to our traditional foodways, because especially as um, we're going to be moving towards some quite um, significant climactic shifts that are forecast in the future, a lot of the plants that we have as our staple diet here in Australia are no longer going to be available to us. Um, things like wheat don't cope very well with, with temperatures going up to what they're predicted to. But then we have things like kangaroo grass that mobs right across Australia have been eating and getting so much nutritional value from for the longest time imaginable because we have grindstones that show now more than 65,000 years of people grinding and processing um, plants to make flour. So it's, I think there is going to be a return and that's what I'm speaking about in all of this work and I guess that's the circles as well, um, the idea of return because I think if our knowledge is empowered in the right way and not taken, not sprinkled on top, um, I think that we have a real chance at meeting some of the challenges that we're facing. I'm not sure where, um, if any of you want to talk about anything at the moment, but I think we're nearly at time. Should we see if anyone has any questions? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone have anything they want to ask? We can hand one of our microphones over if you do. Oh, absolutely, because um, they don't need fertiliser, they need very little water, and there's many people delving into this area at the moment. I think one of the main problems with understanding their viability has that they has been in the past, from my perspective, that they have been, uh, I guess, viewed through a very Western lens, and people have tried to do things like monocultures that completely take these plants out of their cultural context. So I personally believe that this type of agriculture um, and, and the production of these plants actually has to happen in a different type of agriculture to what we have. And we know that the agriculture we're using in this country at the moment is not working. It's stripping country. And so perhaps when we think about these plants, we might have to think about lots of small scale agriculture, which is not a bad thing. Our plants don't do very well in monocultures. And so that Western lens that a lot of people have tried to plant them out with and to make profit with hasn't worked. Our plants work best in the same way that we as Aboriginal people do in our communities. So why do uh, uh, people in communities uh, doing farming with it? Um, well, the reason why we've got less than 2% in the bush foods industry, which is um, a licence to print money, is that people don't have access to capital and they don't have access to land. And that's the main thing that's locking us out of being a part of this burgeoning million, million, million dollar industry every year. So I think some things need to fundamentally change in terms of equity for us to be able to play a greater role in this industry that is doing very, very well. Yeah, there's quite a few um, things that we're definitely participating in this industry, but when you look at 2% and $160 million, it gives you an idea of, of that disparity.
the, the generations when I when I saw that uh, the the ancestors that that just rings so true. You know, okay, you know, I wasn't born in that country. You know, my parents are from there, um, but it is that sense of connection of a, of, a, of an unbroken chain uh, over such a long time. You know, the, the ideas of uh, food and the grindstone, when you were talking about the, gr uh, the grindstones, uh, you know, for Ukrainians that was such a big thing because there was a, you know, man-made famine in the 1932-33 to force people to give up their land and to, 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 the, you know, to the Soviet government to um, uh, and, and just to work, you know, for, for the authorities, uh, for a foreign uh, occupation power. So uh, the, the, grind, the grindstones were confiscated to force people to, uh, so they would not have food to eat, to force them to do what the government had uh, decided to do. And uh, there are these stories about grindstones being hidden in the most, uh, you know, mind-boggling ways in order to have something to grind. In a grind grain, they may have been able to stash away uh, so that people would not die of hunger, uh, you know, as millions did. Um, the, the, the natural uh, setting, that connection of, um, uh, of us with nature and how we, um, how we need to see that as such a precious part of our life, our surrounding, that we don't lose it, that, that it is still there for the generations that are to follow. Um, you know, you have just touched every single nerve, I think, in, in my fiber, and I, and I thank you for that, because I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just moved to tears, because it just rings so true. You, what you are depicting is, is the experience of humanity, and I'm sure, you know, across the cultures. Um, I commend you for this, uh, you know, an absolutely fantastic exhibition. Thanks so much, and also, yeah, for talking about your own situation, because I think for all of us, we wanted to bring people in, for people to think about their own families and their own connection and their own place here on these lands that have been colonised and continue to be colonised today. Um, thanks so much for sharing that, yeah. People have a real um, thing about othering cultures, but... Um, a lot of what we're talking about here is looking for those commonalities as well and, and having more respect for each other. So how do you overcome the pain? You know, how have you done it? Because it's no use living in the pain, is it, of previous injustices? The injustices are, are ongoing and I think you'll find with a lot of uh, minority cultures or oppressed cultures, there's absolutely a very strong sense of humour and a strong sense of connection and belonging, and that's what keeps pushing you forward. And when our chairs are not here, there'll be a bench here so that you can look at the Bonnie photo. I can absolutely recommend sitting on this side of the seat. It'll be the one seat in the gallery where you'll get to see all six artists' works. Yeah, so they're carved, um, and David Doyle has made them as part of his work. Um, so there, I think there's around eight layers of different colours, and they're about one millimetre or less thick. So it's very easy to go through the, the egg as you're carving. Um, and people often look at emu eggs and think that they've been painted, but it's actually people have really carefully gone down layers to get that 3D sort of picture and also all of the beautiful colours. And David Doyle has actually only started carving not long ago, um, but his granny was stolen generations and she didn't start carving in, I think until her 80s and she picked it up and was very good at it. And so he's probably got it in his DNA, which is why he can do it so well after <laughs> not doing it for long, because he told me he did it when he was about 14 and he carved ACDC into an egg and then got bored of it. Um, and now he does these beautiful depictions of plants because he's really interested in plants also. So he and I um, often get together and do little kind of side um, hustles with each other. I help him in the ways that I can and he helps me as he did with the chapter in the book. But yeah, the emu eggs, um, 
The ones that he's got here are depicting really important plants on our country. So, um, yeah, they're, they're very time consuming. Um, David Doyle actually uses um, an, a drill, um, but he taught me how to do it in December last year and I just used uh, like a sharp scalpel and they take a really long time and Raymond wouldn't let me do it in the house because it sounded like someone was grinding their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't say much, but his body language told me to go outside. Um, so it feels like it's one of those things you should do outside on your own. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's very time consuming and it, I, can, yeah, I can vouch for the fact that it's extremely difficult to learn how to do it because yeah, I found it so difficult trying to yeah, just make any kind of mark and David can make these absolutely beautiful um, images of plants. Can I just mention the net? Yeah, sure. So the net is handmade uh, by all of us. We made the string from the three-pronged sedge. Um, Cyperus gymnocollis is the, the Latin name for it. And it's the same sedge that Z has used to make the kakala, the, the bush bananas. And it grows quite prolifically. Z's found a patch here um, at Bunjil Place. Um, so it's just got three prongs. And it's a really beautiful sedge. You, you pull it from the ground. You don't cut it. You pop it out of the ground and then dry it. And then once it's completely dry, you, when you're ready to use it, you re-wet it overnight. You soak it. And then we made the two-ply string from that sedge and then made it into the net. And that's a way for us to collectively have a hand in something that we've made together. But it's also a really beautiful process and is a process that's been used for many you know, generations and is a way to make string which is used for all different um, opportunities like on country to carry things and, and you know, to make nets like this. But the other plant that was used to make even stronger nets for catching ducks and emus was made by a different plant which Zena has within her works. Um, yeah. And I guess, yeah, that's a nice place to end in thinking about that nutature together in that, yeah, there is this work that we made all together and all of the works here, um, I think if you read our artist statements, we're really careful to make sure that, again, we went away from that sterile gallery situation where there's that authoritative voice of the museum or the gallery, and each of the artists speaks from their own first person perspective in these. So you can find out a lot about the themes that we've um, brought up in our works, even more so than what we've been able to tell you tonight. But I think everyone that's come and been able to speak to us so far has been really moved by the fact that all of the works are so completely different and in so many different mediums, but they all speak to each other and that's because country guided us in the making of them and that's our foundation is our country because our country holds all knowledge. And really with the title Nutature, um, it's not just about us being together. We wanted um, all people to come together to care more about country in the, in the stories that we've shared, but most especially to care about our country, which has some pretty dire um, things going on environmentally, especially with our Barca. And if you do want to know more about that, um, there's a newspaper in the welcome space that Raymond um, made look really, really beautiful and put together so people could understand what's been happening on that waterway, our Barca, which some people call the Darling River. Um, and the way that it's been mismanaged and, and what's been happening and how that's affected our people. Yeah, but Nutritia really means together for all of us, um, for everyone visiting, all of us. We want all of us to be able to work together and have those connections that can keep us all um, in a position where we can keep country strong and healthy to feed all of us. So yeah, we might leave it there, thanks. Um,